welcome to episode 211 of We Don't Die Radio. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And I'm really excited about today's episode. And you probably know me by now, but I'm always searching for not only good evidence of the afterlife, but also tools that can help us all live a powerful life while we're here on planet Earth. Well, about five or six weeks ago, I was on the internet and I stumbled upon a great show that I really like personally. It's called Subconscious Mind Mastery Podcast. In fact, I liked it so much that I listened to a few episodes and I emailed the host in hopes that he would be a guest on our show. Well, he said yes, and he's our guest today. His name is Thomas Miller, and along with being the host of Subconscious Mind Mastery Podcast, he's the author of his own first book, which is called Fear Busters. That's available on Amazon. He's also the voice in the box, meaning he's the narrator of 15 audiobooks by author Fred Dodson. Thomas turned his life around 10 years ago from a fundamentalist religious upbringing to exploring things in a new perspective, including what happens after death. He has some unique perspectives that he's going to share today, and they might even be especially of interest to those of you who are raised in a fundamental Christian perspective. You can find out more about Thomas at subconsciousmindmastery.com. And as always, you can go to wedontdieradio.com and click on episode 211, and I will have the links to his show. So Thomas Miller, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Oh, Sandra, thank you so much. And I'll tell you, there's evidence of the afterlife because you are an angel. Aren't you sweet? <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, and I love hearing your voice because I was, I don't want to say I got the warm fuzzies from listening to your show, but I, I listen for a purpose in mind. I, you know, I have a, a very busy mind, not always so positive, and just some of the things that you were sharing on your show really hit home. And I just knew if they made a difference for me, they'd make a difference for my listeners because they're a lot like me. So welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And yeah. what a wonderful topic you have. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, well, where do we get started in your story? Because you're coming to us today from Aspen, Colorado. Beautiful place. I actually was a lifelong dream that manifested two years ago. Oh, and wow. I'm getting ready to start my third ski season, and it was just something I'd always wanted to do. And, you know, when you start applying these things, stuff starts happening in your life, and this was one of those things. So, yeah, it's just a beautiful fall day up here in the Rockies. But where where my story begins is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Wow. which if ever there was – a buckle of the Bible Belt community. Tulsa could be one of those. Okay. We had Oral Roberts and Billy James Hargis and just a very uh, prolific and I, I'd say wonderful people, just wonderful souls, but a very fundamental background in that entire community. And that's what I was raised in. Parents were amazing. My mom and dad are both now in spirit, mm -hmm. and they were incredible parents, but they had both become Christians later in their lives. They weren't raised, neither of them, in Christian homes. They found Christ later in life, and that was the way that my brother and I were brought up. And I basically just uh, thought that that was the way it is. I never questioned it. My mom was very strong. She was the strong personality. My dad was a saint. And because of the dynamic in our family, I either to keep peace at home with mom or to please this incredibly wonderful soul that I looked up to and admired so much, I just never questioned that there was anything but what I was taught. So I grew up in a Bible church for about 10 years and then a Baptist church uh, on through and I actually went to college with the intention of going to the Baptist seminary and becoming a minister. Wow. And then took a turn my second year of school and went into broadcasting, and that sent me down a different path. But 
what happened in my life was I went through two divorces, one when I was 40 and then one seven years later at 47. Mm -hmm. Now, a good Baptist boy from Tulsa is not supposed to get divorced, period, much less twice. Twice, right. So at 47, after going through this, following everything, what happened on that second divorce is I did everything in the book that I had been raised with, had gone to Christian junior high school, Christian college, headed to the ministry. My minor was in biblical studies. I mean, I, you know, I could quote everything, and it didn't work, quote unquote, didn't work. I prayed to save that marriage. I had other people pray. I did everything in the world. And when that didn't happen, two things did. One is I started to shake my fist toward heaven, and it's like, if you can't even save this, don't try to tell me about walking across water. And the (laughs) second thing I did was that I started to look inside. The reality just was there. It was present that, dude, you've got to look at why these people can't be with you. And so I turned all fingers inward and pointed nothing outside. And I I just took a year, in fact, and retreated. I have a podcast on it. It's called The Year in the RV. I spent a year literally living in an RV on purpose and retreated away from everything familiar and took a year and unpacked my life. And that was really what started this whole thread of – because I was angry with God, I kind of think of my life as a – think of your life as a whiteboard. And I just sprayed the little juice on the whiteboard and took the towel and wiped it completely clean. And it was like, okay, I don't believe anything now. No God, no Jesus, no Christ, no church, no nothing. None of that worked. Now put stuff back on the board. We're going to have to rebuild this picture. And I started looking at alternative stuff. Because I figured I'm not going to get the answers where I came from. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started. I think right about then, The Secret had just come out. And the whole conversation around that and law of attraction. And I even looked into astrology and all these things that had been taboo in my upbringing. I started to look at just curiously. Right. Out of what else is there that I can reassemble my life. And as part of that, you mentioned the audio books with Fred Dodson. I was reading a book review one night in the RV, and I was reading an Amazon review, and somebody said, well, this book is okay, but if you really want a good dive on this topic, read Fred Dodson, and specifically mentioned his landmark book, if you will, which is Parallel Universes of Self. So I hopped over there, and just off of the Amazon little teaser page, I could see immediately that this guy had a depth, an understanding of things that I was very much interested in, and I wanted to know more. So I started reading Fred Dodson books. And from that, a couple of years later, had an intuitive prompt to start the podcast in 2013. My mom had just passed, so dad and mom were now both gone. And this was around Easter weekend, and I just had an intuitive prompt to do a podcast. And I had no idea what I was going to start talking about, so I had to find a topic. (laughs) And through all of that journey of that year in the RV, the one thing that I saw as a pattern was – that what what I, well one of the books one of the resources that I read was the power of your subconscious mind by Dr Joseph Murphy, and I realized that everything as I unpacked and unscrewed the events of my life over four decades, that the things that have been imprinted in my subconscious mind had happened had unfolded naturally without me even having to put any effort into it at all. And that's why I decided to focus the podcast on the subconscious mind, because I figured if I can reprogram that, then I could have outcomes unfold in front of me positively. 
if I could just reprogram the negative elements that led to the negative outcomes. Well, is yeah, the answer is the answer that you can. <laughs> Oh, my, absolutely. Man, I wish I could say I had mastery over this one, but I think that's why I was attracted to your podcast, because it's the oh, next the, frontier for me. It truly is. It, it, it Because we have this, if you will, this autopilot mm -hmm. that I think connects to the divine part of our soul. It So we have, obviously, our flesh, and in your topic, that's what dies, mm -hmm. but we have this whole other part of our lives are a whole other part of our being part of our consciousness if you will and that's the part that continues on that's the part that is eternal and i think that our subconscious is the gift of our humanity that d connects directly to that conscious oneness so when we reprogram our subconscious and plug that into the divine into the one field, the source, the universe, God. And we start to live from that side and that channel and that flow of our life. It's, it's a completely different experience and it is truly wonderful. So yes, it can be, it can be changed. It can be reprogrammed. I love it. Um, in your journey, did you stumble upon when the whiteboard was clean uh, thoughts about life after death? Well, my relationship with Fred Dodson really is what changed and answered so many questions that are not answered in the, let's say, New Age community. They certainly weren't answered in the church. We know what the church's position is. Mm -hmm. But what happened is I was, I had started, I think I had started the podcast maybe for a year, and I was getting ready to go on a bicycle ride. And I, so here I am in all my bicycle garb, cleats and everything, and I was filling up my water bottles. And just as clear as you and I are talking here, I had a prompt that said, email Fred Dodson about doing his audio books. So I literally, I set the water bottles on the counter. I walked over to the computer and found his email and sent an email. I just did what I was intuitively instructed to do. And by the next morning, he and I had... Uh, laid out the groundwork for the first audio book, and now I am working on a book that is very relevant to your topic, by the way. It's the 16th book that I've recorded for him, and it's called Lives of the Soul. And wow. it goes into all of this. So I would highly recommend if somebody is interested in exploring this conversation that we're having, mm -hmm. Lives of the Soul would be a great resource. I have a couple of others that we'll talk about. But Fred is, like I said, he's just cut from different cloth. And he, I had so many questions from my upbringing because in the, in the fundamentalist Christian perspective, we are born once. There's a verse in Hebrews in the Bible that says it is appointed to man once to live, once to die, and then the judgment. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that verse came from because Hebrews is not even ascribed to a particular author. We don't know who wrote the book, and we also don't know what happened at the Council of Nicaea. So, you know, it's like you have to look at this skeptically if you're going to pick apart the argument. But basically, the Christian or the fundamentalist perspective is you're born once, you die, and at the point of death – one thing is relevant, and that is whether or not you have prayed some prayer to accept Jesus as your Savior determines whether then you ascend to heaven or you go to hell. And after that, at a point in the future, uh, the body is resurrected and reunited with the soul, and there is a judgment day. And then, depending on whether you have the blood of Christ covering your sins, you either spend eternity in heaven or you spend eternity in forever in anguishing hell and that was the belief that i was taught and like i said i just never questioned that there was anything else right. so in this new exploration fred did a couple of books that really crystallized a whole new way of thinking and the book that completely changed my life and fred had predicted that it would 
was a book called Levels of Energy. And Levels of Energy was written in the mid nine mid let's see. Now I'm going to say it was written around 2000, just after the year 2000. So it's almost 20 years old. Okay. About 10 years before that, a gentleman by the name of David R. Hawkins, who is also in spirit now, wrote a book called Power Versus Force. Oh, it's one of my favorite books. All right. Levels yeah. of Energy is based on the same scale as Power Versus Force. Very similar. Completely different treatment of the book and some different points that I think uh, I think it explains it a little bit better. I might be biased, but that's no, okay. <laughs> but but I it really gave an insight to me that our whole existence is on a scale of consciousness from low to high. And I was able then to see how the upbringing that I that I experienced was so fear based, not only at home but also in the church, and how fear is on the scale level one hundred, which is a very low level of energy. Anything below two hundred, and by the way, the numbers are arbitrary. You could pick anything. The numbers don't mean anything. You really just want to grasp that it's a a vertical scale. Mm -hmm. But fear is below two hundred, and and really almost borders on the psychotic realms of zero to fifty. Um, most of my life was driven by fear. And I realized that. And then when you start to ascend the scale, you realize that in the 200s, for example, you're basically just living life. And that's kind of the, the um, expected level of planet Earth. People just survive. They get by. The upper 200s are, hey, let's party. Let's have a good time. That certainly is part of it. But mostly life in the 200s is lived for yourself. You are, are, you are the primary interest. You are the primary focus of life. So the happy 275 let's party energy is so that I can have a good time. Mm -hmm. Ego-based. Ego-based. Right? Absolutely. The low 200s is I've just got to get through another day. Oh, right? Mm-hmm. At the 300s, you start, to, you start to contribute your life to other people. You start living beyond yourself. In the upper 300s, that's where the financial realm is. That's where making money is, is in the, the upper 300s. So somebody that's doing well financially would have good, strong upper 300s energy. The 400s gets into higher education sciences, entertainers, uh, in order to hold a crowd, you have to be in the 400s energy. So entertainers, singers, comedians, mm -hmm. politicians, our presidents are in the 400s energy. And then when you get into the 500s, you really transcend into the highest levels of energy that we experience on earth. And that is pure, unconditional love creativity, joy, peace, bliss. And that's those are the areas where you just exist really without the attachment to the ego. The ego is not found in the especially upper 500s and into 600s level of energy. And then on this scale, according to Fred's work, above 600, you get into realms that we're going to talk about in the afterlife. You get into frequencies that are not available on planet Earth. Now, we did a sequel to Levels of Energy. So that's the basis. That's, the, that's just a very quick introduction to the scale. Then we did Spectral Consciousness, which is Levels of Energy Book 2. And this is the other book that I would highly suggest. In fact, Sandra, do you listen to audiobooks? I do. Could I send you codes to download these books for free? Would you like that? I would love that. I would be happy to. And then 
In fact, maybe we could work out something here where we could offer a few of your listeners some free books if they would like them as well. That would be superb. All right. Let's. Why don't we do? Why don't we do? Uh, well, actually, uh, probably before your before this podcast is out, the third book of Levels of Energy will be out. So why don't we do a three pack? And I'll just give the Levels of Energy series. How about if we give it to five people? Oh, that's super. All right. Mm-hmm. And then, um, do you want to have them email you and you pick? Or do you want to have them email me and I'll pick? Oh, isn't that great? Uh, let's say they email you. All right. Then have them. So if you'd like the series of levels of energy, if this is resonating, mm-hmm. uh, just it's Thomas at subconsciousmindmastery.com. And you must mention yeah. that you heard him on We Don't Die Radio. Oh, you have Sandra to do that. And oh, also, yes. <laughs> tell a little story as to why this is interesting to you. I'd like to hear and maybe I'll pick from some of the better stories of why this particular topic and is is interesting to you. And I'll bet we get quite a few people who are saying that they would like to look at other perspectives than the than the traditional one that they have grown up with as well. Yeah. Love it. But what so spectral consciousness looks like this that basically we are an eternal soul. And when we die, when the body dies, that that soul continues to live. And this is the book, Lives of the Soul, too. Now, I don't have that on audiobook yet. That will probably be after the first of the year in 2018. But that is a book that people could pick up and also have a look at this. Because the thing about spectral consciousness is Fred analyzes each of the five major religions. And what you start to realize is that all of these have a scale, for example. There are various levels of heaven and various levels of, let's say, the lower energies of punishment, or as the church calls hell. Mm -hmm. There are various levels in all of the major religions. Isn't that interesting? And so what spectral consciousness teaches is that when we enter, when, when the soul passes and we go back to spirit, that we basically ascend or descend based on the level of energy that we exhibited on planet Earth. So if we focus on and achieve and live a higher level of energy or a higher consciousness life, then that is basically the level of energy that we I mean, all you you've talked on your podcast many times about the vibrations and what we how we vibrate out, we attract back. It's the same in death. So let's take somebody who has lost someone recently, and let's say that that person did not go to church. And somebody might be wondering, are they in heaven or in hell? They are in the afterlife in the same frequency that they were living in this life, basically. You know, the the best story of this is Anita Morjani's book, Dying to Be Me. Fabulous book. Yeah. I think her story captures the reality of this as well as anything from several aspects. First of all, that she hovered above her body. So I think that the soul is very aware of what's going on in the room as the body is expiring. Um, I was not there when my dad passed. I was there when my mom passed. She passed in her sleep very peacefully. I know that she was in the room, and we were talking to her, actually. My brother and his wife and I were talking to mom and releasing her and telling her it's going to be okay. We'll be all right. You go on. You're very peaceful. Go see Jesus. Because she wanted to see Jesus, and I totally believe that when she passed that she saw Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
my dad died in his sleep also very peacefully. Anita talks about being in the room. Then she talks about this pull between the earthly plane and the eternal plane and what's on the other side, pure love that she says that you cannot define in human terms. A bliss, a peace, and greeted by relatives who had gone on before. Right. And that matches so many earthly stories. We hear, uh, in fact, my mom told a story of a relative of hers who, who passed and husband had preceded her and she sat up in bed. She had been ill. She got this last little burst. She sat up in bed. She opened her eyes and she held her arms up, which she hadn't been able to do. And she said, oh, Bill, the flowers are beautiful. Oh. And she, closed, she closed her eyes. I love those stories. I've heard so I many. Do. Love them. <laughs> and you can't have so many consistent stories from so many different cultures that say the same thing, mm -hmm. that you know that that's what's on the other side. And I think that there's a separation when the soul starts to pull away from the body like that, but it, it hasn't left the earth plane yet, that... The body, that, so we, we think is there pain and death, not at that point, because the body is left by itself. The consciousness that is the how the body could experience or, let's say, interpret the pain has left. So if somebody has died from an automobile accident or gunshots or some other kind of tragic situation where there was obviously pain that could be involved, I think that our consciousness is separated from that. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, what triggered this whole uh, understanding that is reflected in spectral consciousness is something that happened to Fred himself. Fred Dodson is the author of these books. What happened to Fred in his childhood has made an impression on all of the work that he's done and in his adulthood. When he was a young child, four, five, six years old, he recounts this in Spectral Consciousness, that he experienced what we would term hell as a child. So he was having torments at night, uh, waking up screaming and writhing, and his parents could not understand what was going on, and he was seeing these visions, and he was experiencing this terror, and nobody could figure out what was happening. And it came from nowhere, and it left in nowhere. But he experienced incredibly low vibrations, low levels of energy. And he talked about it again on a descending scale. So it went from bad to worse, basically. And then as soon as that cleared up, for the next several years, he experienced the complete opposite. He experienced a realm of bliss, so much so that he said it made it hard to reconnect with Earth that this plane was so ethereal and so peaceful and so wonderful that it, as he said, in, the, in those years that he was dealing with the lower vibrations, it made him appreciate Earth. In those years that he would experience the higher vibrations, it would make Earth like, like oh man, I've got to go back there. Right, right. <laughs> and... Then he spent the next about 10 or 15 years trying to understand what had happened as a child. And that is basically what launched his work in uh, reality creation coaching and what he's done in his books and all came from that childhood experience. And he believes what, he, what happened to him is that he literally was given the vision of what those lower energies are, those lower astral realms, if you will and the higher realms so that he could uh, understand and put together this scale of energy and teach people 
that if we pursue higher consciousness, this goes back to your uh, effort of this podcast, is to help people live the best life they can. When we pursue the higher levels of consciousness, that sets the stage for where we're going to go after we die. And if we choose to come back to the earth, it sets the stage for the kind of life that we will have. I mean, we hear about karma. Right. It sets that stage of what our next life will be. Well, I sure, number one, want a good next life. And when I close my eyes on planet Earth, I don't want to open them up with regrets and things like that. So although I'm not an angel, like you mentioned in the beginning, perfect angel, um, but I do my best. I think always trying to be better, help others, serve mankind, getting f- the focus off me and the ego and onto others. Uh, not Like I said, not perfect, but I... I'm all for any tips to raise our vibration and our levels while we're here on planet Earth. I think we all are. And I do think, too, Thomas, that there's a common denominator that happens. Like Fred got his vision as a youngster. I think a lot of myself and a lot of people listening right now have had our hearts cracked open by grief and losing a loved one. But I think it's like giving us an opportunity like you had to... Uh, clear the board and and start looking within. And I think grief can do that to us and really have us start looking at our lives and what gives us meaning and how we can have the best life possible. I get that same feeling every time I attend a memorial service, especially if the life was well lived. You get that desire to live up to that person's legacy, don't you? Yes. Yes. That person becomes then an inspiration. It really is amazing when you think about it in our physical form. You know, you reaching out like these podcasts that we do and the people Mm -hmm. that are touched by those. And then the circles, those concentric circles that go out from our life and we touch our family and our friends and then people, our acquaintances. And we have such a ripple effect in society that if we're taken out suddenly – we are missed. Our presence is missed. And it's such a shock, especially if somebody passes young. Right. And yet, in spirit, we know one thing from these stories that our role will reverse, and then we will be out there to greet others who are coming out of the earth plane. So we'll be a greeter. And then I think the key, and you talk about how to live that higher vibration life, Mm -hmm. the Bible said it, Jesus said it, and John Lennon said it. And my mother could not stand John Lennon, but she (laughs) adored Jesus. All we need is love. Love is the key. Love is the purest form of the highest energy that we can experience on earth. So if we can simply strive for love in all that we do and truly detached from the ego self, from the world self, that love that is unconditional. And that's a hard thing often to do when we're driven by the ego. But if we can find that pure love and make sure that most of what we do and how we act and respond, our motivations are driven from love then we will be living in the highest vibration possible here on earth most of the time. It sounds so easy, but... Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, all we need is love. Well, I would like to talk to or have you share a little bit about a uh, little subconscious mind mastery. It's, you know, so I've been studying the afterlife, human transformation, about 20 years and I still wake up in the morning with this I wouldn't say evil ego but it's not good enough this that and the other thing you know there's always something 
it's always looking at what's undone as, as opposed to what I've accomplished. Uh, there is fear that comes over stupid stuff. And so I know and I've studied some great things and I, I do have the tools to shift, you know, being grateful and other things if I can remember them in the in the moment. Um, but can you shed a little light on what it takes or how we can begin to shift um, some of these deep-rooted subconscious beliefs and and have things like your now living in Aspen, you know, you've manifested something great, how we can even begin to shift our thinking. Maybe more so than that, tapping into a power source that is greater than ourselves. Oh, I like I, the sounds of that. I, Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I came across this. This really developed over miles and miles of hikes up here in these amazing mountains. So when I was young, mom and dad would bring us up to Colorado and I just always loved it here. My heart sang a different song up here and I always thought how cool it would be to live here. And life took a different course, as I said, went down different paths and then kids and you get ingrained and whatnot, and I ended up in Texas for most of my most of those years. So when I came up here, it was just this unleashing of amazing. Oh boy, you talk about having your heart just sing every minute. Wow! And I would get out on these hiking trails and start realizing that in that heart connection, you know, and some people don't like the mountains and some people can't handle the altitude and some people like the beach better. Right. So just saying it's, it's that place that makes your heart sing is the connection point here. But I would get out on these hiking trails and that's where my heart would just explode. And I started realizing that I could hear intuitive instructions, if you will, clearer and better when I was on those hiking trails than any other point. Wow. So I would start looking forward to my hikes to basically get these downloads of, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? And what came very clear is that we have, like I said, we have this side of us that I think the subconscious mind represents that is connected to divine source and whether you want to call that god or the universe mm -hmm. or anything else that we are connected to that and that is universal and it is not exclusive and that that is available to everyone i think it's like a muscle it's a muscle that we have to exercise we have to use but we have this other side of us called the ego self mm -hmm. that wants to be the alpha dog on the neighborhood and the ego self purely operates out of past experience. It operates out of knowledge. So it thinks that it knows best based on what has happened previously in our life, right? Right. So we have this contrast. Be and, and here again is another analogy that's in levels of energy, actually, in the audiobook levels of energy, that our life is represented by let's say a stream or a river and you think about i when i think of this analogy my mind goes to the san juan river in northwestern new mexico it's a wonderful trout fishery and it's a fairly large river and it has rocks in the middle of it and it has fast currents and it has slower currents and big areas that are slow and ripply and then it has fast shoots that you have to be in a boat to go through and all kinds of different varieties but if you think about that we enter the river of life when we're born and at some point down the river there's a ramp that is our takeout spot <laughs> and that's where that's when mm -hmm. we will die but in if otherwise unobstructed that our life life itself is organized and this goes back to this whole soul path thing when we die we go back to the soul's the soul state and 
eventually choose whether to come back to this earth school, to this reincarnation again, and we enter another river for the purpose, the whole purpose of earth is for souls to be able to ascend in consciousness if we choose to. So our life by its design, where we're born, who our parents are, who our siblings are, geographically where we are, our race, our gender, etc., is all structured for us to achieve a certain soul purpose. So that would be like floating down the middle of the river. Life will get you to the point where you're supposed to be if you basically just kind of keep your hands off and let it do its thing. Me, in my river, for all those years, man, I was trying to paddle off to the side and drag my boat over because, hey, Sandra, there's a better river over here. And I know if we can just get on the other side of those trees that there's a better river over there. Come on. Come on. Let's pull the boat out. Let's go. You know, it's like – or I'd be paddling upstream or sideways or backwards or running into rocks and just all kinds of stuff. And it's just a lot better if you – figure you're in a boat, you've got an oar in your hand, you can use the oar, but you don't have to a lot. You can just kind of let life unfold as it is. And to me, this whole thing of intuition is our soul's connection to staying in the middle of the river. In other words, staying close to that divine purpose of why we're here. So if we can figure out how to release the grip on that oar, which is letting that alpha dog ego mind take a step back, then we open up to that intuitive voice, which is our connection to the divine. That's the connection to our soul's purpose. That's the connection to that hand that silent invisible hand on our shoulder that we know is there but we so often turn it off because we're so driven by our ego so i decided to start a coaching program through the podcast and have been working with people on this and basically have always come back to this that the ego mind wants to be the alpha so even if we get an intuitive prompt i tell a silly story when I first came up here, I was skiing, and this I, I had not been skiing that much in my life. It just, you know, three days here and two days there mm -hmm. kind of thing through the years. And I didn't have any kind of system worked out like I do now. So I was on this chairlift. It was in the first couple of weeks that I was here, and I was going up to the top of the mountain. And I knew I'd had these intuitive voices, and as I had tracked my life back, like I said, I found different spots where these intuitive voices would show up at specific times, but didn't think about them as a daily thing or that they could – that there was like this constant communication that could actually go on. So I was riding up the chair, and I decided to take my glove off and reach in my pocket and get my phone out, and I was going to take a picture or whatever. And just as my hand went into my jacket, I got this don't. I mean, like, don't do it. And I thought, nah, it's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I, I won't drop it. I'll hold on tight. Mm -hmm. So I went against that intuitive prompt. And I pulled my phone out and took a picture, Facebook, whatever, I don't know stuck the phone back in my pocket and I was like, see, it's all right as I was zipping my jacket up. And then I started looking for the glove. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, you know, I'm looking to the left, I'm looking to the right. The guys behind me had to have been laughing because as I turned around, they said, it's down there by tower 12. And I had dropped the glove. Funny. Well, that was just a little lesson of, listening to that voice and the the thing to me that became so clear on the hiking trails was that we have to yield that ego self to that intuitive voice so instead of arguing with it which we often do mm -hmm. oh no but i wanted to this is a great picture i want to take this picture now if i had just 
listen to that voice and zipped the jacket back up and put the glove back on and enjoyed my ride back up to the top, I wouldn't have dropped the glove on a steep cliff that I had to basically crawl into because I wasn't a proficient enough skier to go into the terrain where the glove was. <laughs> you know, it was like a very direct lesson from the universe. I'm thinking I, of, oh, sorry to interrupt. Well, no, I just said I found that when I follow that intuitive voice, every time it steers me in the right direction. I was just thinking of row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. That's perfect. <laughs> it fits. And that it, is perfect. Yeah, you know, and I often want to direct my stream, or, you know, my boat upstream, and I think it needs to go over here, or, you know, it needs to go over here even faster. You know, there's no gentle or merrily <laughs> too often. And I'm also thinking about when you're hiking and you're hearing that wisdom. Uh, I had gone on a vacation years ago, and it was like the Virgin Islands, I think. I was on a cruise, and I met a security guard, um, older fellow, and out of his mouth came so many really profound words of inspiration about being human. And I just asked him, I said, you know, what book did you get? those great quotes from because I mean they were really great he says oh no he says I've spent my life on this beach and I heard it in the waves all this came to me in the waves oh I love that yeah so he found his bliss and tapped into that inner wisdom like you hiking so is there then for us to do is find Th those things that make us happy, those times of, because I I want to tap into this more, and I also want to talk about fear a little before we end this uh, conversation. But it's it's been interesting in the coaching that I've been doing mm -hmm. because I've found people who will say it's almost kind of one of two things. People will say, "Oh man, I have that intuitive voice. I've always had it, but I don't listen to it." That's right. usually what they'll say, or. Conversely, people will say, I never hear from that. I never hear that intuitive voice. I use muscle testing, kinesiology. We mm -hmm. won't go into that, but that's one of the ways that you can tap into it. I think another way is to get in that heart bliss state. And the difference there, the, the gentleman by the sea, mm -hmm. me up in the hiking, is what's happening there is you're opening your consciousness up to that higher realm by being in that state of high energy. And the ego self at that time is less influential. So you're not as distracted by the events of the day, by the things around you, by the chaos, by the traffic, by the noise in the city, etc. And when you can tune that ego self down, and I would even get to the point where on the hiking trail, I would get out there and here goes the monkey mind, right? But that, 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 that. <laughs> I know it well, yes. And I would get down the trail a little bit and let it do its thing. And then I would say to myself, okay, conscious mind, are you now willing to stay silent? And I'd look at something up on the trail, up at a, you know, a pine tree up there. Are you willing to stay quiet just until I get up to that pine tree? Would you agree to just listen to subconscious listen inside and with that agreement yes in other words are you through talking <laughs> right <laughs> you know, it's like with that agreement then i would move up to the pine tree up the way and just and not allow the conscious mind to do its thing and then when i got up to the tree i'd say okay now what did you think about what we just heard and eventually, as I continue to work through this process, I got to the point where literally was able to reach a state of constant agreement with the conscious ego self of being in complete surrender to the intuitive self. Now, the problem with that, you think, well, then what do you do with the conscious mind? I mean, I've got lists. I've got stuff to do. I have to be able to you know, make reservations mm -hmm. and do certain things. 
Well, that's all great. If the conscious mind starts to take action driven by or governed by, instructed by the intuitive voice, then the world self, the ego self, has a beautiful job of doing everything that we do, but you do it from the intention of being instructed by that intuition that is our connection with divine source. So it puts us in a state of basically constantly asking, am I in the middle of the river? Or is this a middle of the river activity that I'm about to encounter? Or if we've met somebody new in our life, is this person a middle of the river type person? Mm -hmm. Or is this somebody that's going to cause me to get off track and go down the wrong branch of the river? Uh, and, and then with that, the conscious mind is always in agreement. And in agreement, then we start to take the actions accordingly. So in other words, if somebody says, if the, if the intuitive voice comes along and says, move to Colorado, then you have to start packing. And that's where the conscious mind gets busy. If at some point intuition says it's time to go to another place, then I'll begin packing up here and starting to look for where that place is. That's how I use it now, is always trying to uh, seek the intuitive voice or seek the middle of the river, knowing that I just have too much of a track record. I know what it was before, and it led to not good outcomes. Right. And then as I shifted and I look at how life is now, there's no place I'd rather be. And it is all a journey. I, you know, I, I think that's our adventure being human is there's always going to be a gap. There's always going to be something to move forward towards. And I think even by us having this conversation and anyone who's listening, that's raising the levels and our thoughts and I think our vibrations and, and all of that. When I started doing that podcast, I thought, you know, there's, I should do something to close it with. Mm -hmm. You know how Paul Harvey would say, good day? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I needed my version of good day. And it, I just, I was kind of stuck there. I had stopped the recording and I, I thought, ah, I'll just say, enjoy the journey. And that's what I've been saying ever since is in just as best we can, if we can get to the place where we enjoy the journey, it is a journey. Wow. I'm excited. You know, and I'm even thinking, you know, my mom would always say, you can't talk and listen at the same time. And I'm just thinking about using our mind, you know, when it's so busy talking and using us, we can't listen to that divine inner voice or whatever we want to call it. Uh, and it really does take stopping, listening, being present. And we can use our mind for good, you know, um, instead of being used by it, we can use it. <laughs> a great thing that just comes to mind is my dad. My dad had a little growth on one of his vocal cords when he was in his late 40s. And back then, all they knew to do was just to surgically take it out and hope that they got it. Right. So he, he always talked with a whisper like this. So you think about – and, and – and, Growing up, we never had yelling in our home because to hear dad, we all had to be quiet. You know, we had to wow. quiet down and lean in. Right. So you think of the ego self, conscious mind, as this bombastic, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, have the, you know, the type that mm. just bolts into the room and takes over the show and blah, 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 blah. That's our conscious mind. But our intuitive voice is soft and we have to quiet down and we have to lean in to hear it oh i'm gonna think of your dad now <laughs> there's a legacy yeah dads are very special uh, thomas can we talk a little bit about fear i would love sure. to tell you i've got fear handled and i i do know there's some 
you know, when I'm afraid and I go forward anyways, I feel good after and I have an accomplishment and things are never as bad as I fear they will be. But it still can be such a block. It can just, I I don't know, I can convince myself that I can never do this or this will never happen. And um, I get crippled by fear. And I know I'm not alone there. And I did just download, I went to your website and, um, First of all, I'm going to get your Fear Busters book, but I was able to download your meditation on fear, even though I haven't listened to it yet. But uh, is fear always going to be there in our lives, or is there a way that we can turn it down a little bit? I've wrestled with this one because, again, reconstructing this perspective that I have on mm-hmm. things now is I think I brought fear in with me, so a big part of this journey is to deal with fear. So one of the first things I would suggest is perhaps that that might be in the space for you, that maybe you came in with some fear karma and that this the structure of this life, so those challenges are bumping up against that. Whenever we bump up against something repeatedly over and over, I think it's something that we brought in with us. So there's a purpose for us to deal with fear. I addressed the book as fear being the result of programming. And again, that went back and retraced my upbringing where I grew up in a home. I mean, I, I've I've said my mom, God love her soul. She was afraid of the Democrats. She was afraid of, <laughs> of yeah. the Beatles. She was afraid of the economy. She was afraid of inflation. She was afraid of war. Right. Uh, just so much fear fear that gripped that home and then when you throw the church element on mm-hmm. to it that if oh my if you don't accept if you don't say this prayer then you're going to die and go to hell i mean how much you know how's that's that pretty be? scary eternity yeah. yeah yeah you know it's like so more fear right and that's one of the reasons why i don't think any of that model holds up because when you put it against the scale of energy it just it just it kind of washes out but I addressed the book from fear being a programmed state. So the book goes through several ways that you can reprogram the fear, and there are different ways to do it. My favorite is to listen to audio recordings. So you could use the fear meditation. Mm -hmm. You could even record your own into your phone and just play it back. There's a lot of merit to the idea that when we are asleep, our conscious mind is resting, so it's not chattering, and our subconscious is open to receive. So if we play audio while we're asleep, either through sleep headphones or even through our phone just at the side of the bed Mm -hmm. or through a speaker, that and we put a track on and just put it where it loops over and over and over, that we can listen to statements that can program us in the direction that we want to go. And I did this for years, especially in those years where I was uh, changing everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very valuable tool is you can take an audio recording that addresses the other side of the fear. So if you can dissect what you're afraid of, or even better, what's behind that, why am I afraid of this? And that might take some introspection. Mine happened over a year in the RV, and as I said, over many bottles of wine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But that's how I, that's how I, and many journals. Um, But if you can get what's underneath the fear, then you could create an audio recording. That's one of many techniques that we talk about in there, but that's my favorite. If you wanted to go straight to the, what's if you had one bullet, one thing, one tool, that would be the one. But fear is one of the lowest levels of energy. So when you realize that when fear comes, you know, you can choose 
th- even throughout the day, we experience many of the levels of emotion or levels of energy, levels of consciousness. Yes. We can, we can feel pure love. And at the same time, a few minutes later, we can be angry at the person in front of us in traffic. Right. So we can, we can go up and down the realm all day long. So when you sense fear coming, you realize on this scale what that means. Wait a minute. I'm down here in the gutter. I'm down here on the, one of the lowest levels of energy. I'm about to make a decision or a statement or a comment or choose left or right based on something that doesn't serve me, will only attract negative things into my life has no positive value at all. I mean, unless it's a rattlesnake on the trail in front of you, fear does not have, it does not serve a purpose. Right. So if you immediately offset the fear with an intention of love or a higher intention of, say, service to others, just getting out of yourself, and you start to think of that situation that you were afraid of. I mean, a lot of people are afraid of death. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are afraid of uh, not having enough month at the end of the bills. <laughs> you right. know, it's like money issues. Um, whatever the whatever the fear is based on, if you just realize that that is coming from one of the like like let's let's think about on the scale of energy would you choose right now to uh to be like one of the very lowest levels obviously is let's say anxiety or dread mm-hmm. or um like we've just been through this horrific situation in Las Vegas whatever drove that man to do that would you choose to spend the rest of the afternoon living your life in that context, in that energy? No way, Jose. No way, <laughs> right. No way. And and you can step back away from whatever it is that you're dealing with and consciously say, no, I choose that I would not do that. Same thing with fear. Fear is just one nudge higher on the scale of energy than that. It's a lower energy than pride and narcissism. It's a lower energy than anger. So we think about, would I choose to live the rest of my afternoon in that kind of energy? And then when you consciously say no, then you can go way up the scale and just look at what is the opposite of that fear. Right now, in this moment, as I'm facing this emotion, what would be the opposite of that fear? Well, courage, Mm -hmm. strength, boldness, power, love. And so the first thing you could think of is, and maybe it would apply, maybe it wouldn't, but how could I serve or help somebody else? How could I do something for somebody else, another human being, not myself? Because what you're fearing is the ego self protecting itself yes. from something. So if you just get outside of that, that will help just resolve the fear right there. Simply the decision, the conscious decision not to keep wallowing in it and then stepping outside of yourself into somebody else's world or benefit. How could I do something, whether it's online or in person, to help somebody else. And it might be even just a phone call to somebody to yes. encourage. It can be very simple. You know, I just thought of something I read in a book once is to make a list of like my successes and not ego based, but just some, what are some of the things I've done. And the more and more I write, I realize that this person who's done all these great things is going to have be afraid of picking up the phone and calling somebody like it just it's not a match (laughs) (laughs) so it can move me into that higher level (laughs) that's a great you know that's a great 
thought right there of even picking up the phone and calling someone because what is one of the greatest fears that people have is cold calling. You know, yes. it's like people who are in sales who get on the phone and call somebody. You never know what's on the other side of that call. And I don't know that that's as effective today in the world of cell phones and just not mm-hmm. answering things when we don't recognize the number and that type of thing. But let's say that you were afraid to pick up the phone and and give what you have to the other side of that conversation, you know, that would indicate that you are not strong and resolved in that what you believe you are offering to that person would truly benefit them. Right. Because if you had something that really would help somebody in their life, improve their life, and you wanted to just have a conversation about it, there should be no fear in that whatsoever. And if they slam the phone down on you and don't ever call me again, you're, is that any reflection on you or your intention or what it is that the reason why you were calling them? No, that's their business. None whatsoever. And Unless if they were having a we have some limited, day, limited belief that we're not good enough or you know, any of those kind of things. And see, and right there, you can just put that on the scale that that person was operating out of some low energy in that ah. moment, out of their ego self. You, on the other hand, really have something that you want to offer that can help people, and you're willing to just jump right back to the next to the next phone call. Mm, this is good stuff because it you know helps us have compassion for other people. It's a lot of times they say it's what you don't know you don't know. Well, all of a sudden we're starting to know about the ego self and the levels and all these things. And so when we see somebody else operating from a lower level, we can say, ah, it's not worth getting angry at him. It's just acting from a lower level. There was a line in one of those books, and I went back and reviewed them ahead of this our interview here because I wanted that information fresh on my mind. And one of the lines in there is just priceless. The world self, the ego, is only and always interested in what it can get. The higher self is always only interested in what it can give. I love it. So go out – on a Massachusetts freeway this afternoon and find out how many people are operating from higher self or lower (laughs) self. (laughs) You're a funny man. (laughs) The world operates in the realm of the ego. Yes. And it is mostly all about what can I get. And it's rare the person who steps onto the earth plane with the approach of what can I give. I love it. And I'm, I'm left with this in this conversation of going hiking with you or being the man watching the waves that we don't have to listen to that. We can kind of tune in and go down the middle of the river uh, merrily. <laughs> that is available to everyone everywhere all the time. And we have no idea really of what the results can be and how good our journey is. And I, I really do, when my time comes to leave this earth, I want to look back and really think I did go merrily down the stream. I did take on some of these challenges. I did want to make, you know, actively make a difference for others, uh, be in a higher vibration that'll lead to wherever I'm going next. I want to have that. I don't want to have all the regrets and I had the fear and so I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to choose to live life that way. See, and you just said it. I don't want to choose to live life that way. Mm -hmm. So every day we wake up and choose how we're going to be that day. Yep. I love it. I want to be respectful of time because I know you've got another call coming up. But Thomas Miller, I think this conversation is just like starting to peel the outer uh, outer level of an onion, right? Like we just started getting into something and there's so much more. You are so right. Oh, my goodness. And And I'm grateful. When you think you've made progress there's a whole nother layer <laughs> it just keeps coming until we until we die literally until we sip that last breath of air we are peeling the onion and that's okay 
And then they say when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And I'm grateful that you have many, many, many hours of your podcast. And I'm excited to be able to learn more about Fred Dodson. You've said enough that I'm really interested in his words and his books. And I love that I get to listen to you. (laughs) You should uh, reach out to Fred. I can give you his email. and. Tell him that we did an interview and that you would love to talk to him. I would imagine that he would be happy to be with you. This is just the next level. I I think once we get to the point where we really get that we don't die, that um, our bodies may go, but we stick around and that our life is for a purpose, then we start dealing with these day-to-day things of really getting our money's worth out of our life. You know, so the onion starts getting peeled, and who knows? You know, when you start studying this, you learn about soul partners and that we kind of end up with the same relationships uh, over and over, and we meet those people again on earth, and there's this pattern to this. For someone who has lost a loved one recently, I think you can take comfort in several things, and that is there's a universal consensus that there is love, serenity, bliss. I mean, when we leave here and we go higher, earth is a lower place. So we think we're leaving this this area, this, this place that we've known and lived and our loved ones and everything. What's on the other side is higher. And unless somebody has lived in those extremely low energies, and that's a whole other thing to deal with, that death is a release into a place of bliss and that when your time comes to go, that face of that person who you recently lost is going to be on the other side waiting for you, smiling and with a love for you that you cannot even fathom in human language. That's a tremendous comfort and oh, what a, wonderful peace when it comes our own time that we don't have to fear death either oh that's beautiful i just have a big smile on my face and i'm just imagining crossing a finish line and having my dad and grandparents and everybody just with love cheering me on you did it and that we all have that to look forward to that's the comfort while we miss them in the flesh yeah we can reconnect with them in the spirit yeah i love it Thomas, thank you for being our guest today. Sandra, thank you. This has been a special time. And, really appreciate it. Uh, it's great. Uh, one more time, let us know your website. And then if you can also mention about five people writing you and giving them the, the books. Sure. Yeah, I'll give you the Levels of Energy series. And that is all through Thomas at subconsciousmindmastery.com. The podcast is, of course, by that same name. It's on iTunes and the website. And then if you'd like to just go check out all of the books that have been recorded by Fred Dodson, that website is freddodsonaudiobooks.com. That's a site that I actually maintain. So every time we get a new one, we'll update it. That's the complete inventory, and you can peruse there and and get some really, really great material. That's um, I'm glad to have my my name and my voice attached to it for forever and ever. Oh, I'm so excited to listen. And you offer a couple of things on your website, Unconditional Love Meditation. You can check out the Fear Busters book. I'm really excited about that. Uh, you might be somebody that uh, Thomas's voice and his style resonates with you, and you might want to look into a coaching session or two or three or whatever. Um, but I really recommend that you check out Subconscious Mind Mastery. Dot com. So again, Thomas, thank you for being our guest here today. I can't, I'm, I'd like to extend an invitation for you to be my eternal friend because I think <laughs> oh, you got it. get along you got forever it. and have connected. some more conversations. <laughs> and for our listener, thank you for giving us your time today to listen, to put yourself into this conversation. And and I invite you, as always, to visit we don't die radio.com. That's our, our home base. And uh, so many great things there. You can 
check out all the past episodes and get a very healing audio that I recorded called How to Survive Grief. And then my latest PDF report called 19 Reasons to Believe in the Afterlife. And if you're a Facebook user, I invite you to type in We Don't Die Listeners into your Facebook search and you'll find a group of almost 3,000 people that are speaking the same language and looking for a good life and helping you through grief, belief in the afterlife, and and so much more. So I I will invite you to join us there. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So take some time today to catch yourself in the act of being in fear or one of those lower levels and, and raise it, whether it's making a difference for another person or thinking of something you're grateful for or all of the above. Get out in the sunshine, uh, go for a walk, and make it a great day. So thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Oh,